Loretta. Thank you so much, Gano. And thank you so much to everybody who has joined us tonight. I hope you'll be enjoying our session. So let's get started. Um, here we are with a very interesting topic, self-regulation and online learning. This is such a buzzword now, right? <laughs> um, we have Chadia Mansour, our subject matter expert for tonight. Thank you, Chadia, for joining us. So Chadia Mansour holds a BA in English for academic purposes from Tunisia, an MA in applied linguistics from the US, and is currently an all but dissertation doctoral student in distance education and online learning in Canada, working on her research on online second language acquisition. She also holds the Fulbright Foreign Languages Teaching Certificate, TESOL Certificate, Certificate of College Teaching, Cambridge Assessment English Certificate of Teaching English Online, and the Canadian College of Educators Portfolio-Based Language Assessment Certificate. Chadia has 20 years of experience in language teaching in higher education, including ESL, EFL, EAP, ESB, and Discourse and Language Across Cultures internationally in Tunisia, USA, and Qatar. Chadia also has an extensive experience in languages, English and Arabic curriculum, and instructional design for in-person and blended learning. Thank you so much, Chadia, for accepting our invitation and sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you. Thank you, Tessel and Terrier. Thank you, Loretta and Gunnar, for uh, the invitation. And I'm very pleased to be with the Tessel and Terrier community uh, today to uh, share what I know and to learn from also my colleagues who are here today. So I'm really looking forward to for, uh, an engaged discussion. Tonight. We're looking forward to it too. Thank you. Absolutely. So let's, let's immediately start with our first introductory questions. And the very first one is, what is self-regulation? All right, thank you. Yes, so that is the question for me. Before I answer that question, I'm going to ask the uh, audience to use the chat uh, to think, what is the first thing that comes to mind when I say self-regulation before I would share with you some theor theories about it? Just anything, close your eyes. When I say self-regulation, one or two words, what is it? What comes to mind? Self-control. Mm -hmm. Yes, control. Control and autonomy. Mm -hmm. Okay, good old, you go, sorry. <laughs> That's okay, you can do that too if you like. Okay. Balance, control. Mm -hmm. Monitoring. Self-awareness, monitor. Great suggestion. So here we have a lot of uh, monitoring and we have self-awareness, which is also very important. Uh, balance, yes. All our great autonomy, uh, everyone. Is, uh, these are great suggestions. Yes. So we, we hint to uh, towards the um, what we call self-regulation in here. You're at the right track, all of us. Resp responsibility and actions. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> that, is, that is also important. So um, let me share with you some of the theoretical background of self-regulation. Self-regulation is a theory that is actually inspired by behavioral theories and by sociocognitive theories. So when we think about behavior, then we're talking about performance as skills, right? And when we think about um, cognition, then we're talking about the mental ability. But um, is self-regulation as a theory, is that? Not really. It's not the cognitive ability, meaning it's not we are, some people are able to, to self-regulate while others are not, or some people are able to perform in terms of behavior and others are not. No, what Zimmerman, Zimmerman is the leading in self-regulation uh, theories, uh, which actually started a long time ago, even in the 30s, in the 1930s, right? Uh, with uh, Skinner and all the behaviorism and then all the way to 750s and 70s with uh, social cognition. So what is it? It's a process. So we're talking about steps and we're talking about cycle of a process. And I will quote here Zimmerman, um, it is the self-directed process 
by which learners transform their mental abilities into academic skills, right? Um, so how is that? Here, meaning that self-regulation refers to that self-generated thoughts, it's the feelings as well, and self-generated behaviors that are oriented to attaining goals. So that's why I said at the beginning, it's not really only a mental ability or an academic performance, but rather a process because, and that process is self-generated, right? You are the one who is thinking, it includes the feelings, it includes the thoughts, it includes the behaviors, all towards attaining goals, all right? And there are also four models. I mean, it's a huge thing, but I picked one model today that I thought would be useful for the, uh, the TESOL community here, which is um, uh, Zimmerman's model four, what we call model four. Why? Because it includes metacognitive and motivational strategies. And that's what really our students and us as instructors need, right? Um, so in this model, briefly, there are three phases. The first phase is what we call the forethought phase. So if it's a process of thinking and self-generated process, um, the first one is that we need to get into that state of mind, right? Of thinking about what we're doing, we're going to do, of thinking about our goals that we're going to set. And that's why we call it the forethought phase. So that in that phase, what matters is that process of thinking about the task analysis, meaning what are the goal settings that we're trying to do here? Is there any strategic planning that we need to do? We can ask ourselves, what is really asked to do, right, in that particular task? And how are we going to do it? And when are we going to do it? What is needed? that we're going to do it. Like what, what kind of materials, what kind of other materials that we might need, whether as instructors designed for our courses or as learners that we're doing. So that's the very thinking. This, this interestingly happens uh, not only as a sitting around your desk, like I'm sure many of us would relate to that. You know, I remember Krashen in, in one of his talks that he, he loves to do the dishes when he has like one of the big tasks or before writing. Uh, you know, anything very important. I tend to do the same thing. You know, it happens um, not only when you sit around, but it's a lot of thinking in there. The second phase is what we call the performance phase, that, that we thought about the task and all the planning and the goal and uh, what is needed. We get into the performance phase, right? And this Performance phase are three things. The self-control that we, uh, our attendees uh, thought about, yes, right? Uh, so it's an autonomous learning, using strategies to address the task, self-instruction, how we're gonna do it, time management, and environmental structuring, meaning you need to find your space, the studying space, the devices that you need, the material that you gather, and also help seeking. You know, If you're stuck, then you seek help from your instructor or peers, or from a role model that you think that person is really productive and self-regulated. And the third, the, the second point in, in this second, uh, in the performance phase is what we call the interest incentives. So you have a goal, right? And you ask yourself, why am I doing this? Now, from, for example, I'm a doctoral candidate and it's a very long journey. <laughs> and, and you have so many other commitments and other professional commitments as well and family commitments and every day this interest incentives of the question, why am I doing this, is a daily question, right? Yes. I'm yes? Um, right? So yeah. this relates to the motivation. So you're, you're, you're talking to yourself and you're, you're trying to understand what are your motives to do that. And that's also the self-consequences that you're going to do. Am I, when meeting my goals, what am I going to do, right? Am I going to have an ice cream? Uh, tonight or not, if I'm not, what are the consequences? Oh, I thought tomorrow I'm going to have a movie night. Maybe I won't because I didn't really meet my goals. So there, and then there's self-observation. And here, what we call the metacognitive monitoring, right? You are monitoring your own thinking. So metacognition is thinking about your own thinking. And here you are self-observing, self thinking about your own thinking, right? So it's very, that's why it's so cognitively heavy, right? Um, 
I tell my husband, nobody really understands what I'm doing sometimes. It's, there's a lot of cognition going on, right? And a lot of thinking. And these are exactly the phases that I'm talking about uh, right now that pushes the, push you to be self-regulated. So um, in, in, in that metacognitive monitoring, you're, you gotta be asking yourself, what are the best ways here of learning for me? What is the best efficient way? Um, for me right now, for instance, I tend to use the computer, but I know other people that still like to, you know, like a piece of paper and writing and taking notes, etc. So is it digital? Is it, uh, you know, the, um, the notes and paper? Or is it recording myself while trying to understand the concept? Is it practicing a task before with uh, colleagues or, you know, is it sharing with my other colleagues and instructors before, you know, jumping into the classroom with it. Um, I tend to do also a lot of uh, mind mapping. Mind mapping meaning what's the concept and what I'm, what's the best way for me to, to deal with that. How am I gonna tackle that task or concept? So that's part of the self-observation. It's a very long theory, but so this is my last you know, minute for you to uh, give you the floor, right? Um, the, the, the last phase is the self-reflection, right? Now, this is the third phase of this model. And here comes the self-judgment, <laughs> right? So we thought about goals, we set the goals, and we thought about how we're gonna do it, what to do, et cetera, in the fourth uh, thought phase. And then we got into the performance phase and our motivation and uh, our, you know, observing our own um, particular ways of doing things. Now we're gonna reflect. Did it really go well, whatever I did in the other two phases? Is there anything that I need to change in terms of my performance to be better? Are my strategies working well? You know, are there any gaps that I need to fill in? Uh, do I need probably more help from others, right? What can I do to do basically better? So this is in a, in a very, very brief uh, way uh, the theoretical background of uh, self-regulation, particularly, as I mentioned, um, Zimmerman model four of uh, metacognition and motivational strategies. And um, please feel free to, I will check the chat right now, uh, or if you have anything, um, you know, that you'd like to ask me, I'm very happy about it. So again, our question was, what is self-regulation? Mm -hmm. So Chadia. <laughs> <laughs> gave a complete overview of what self-regulation is but um our question would be what is it in particular in the steps um in, in this process of self-regulation that you actually do or have experience or enjoy doing for that matter for example personally i i really uh, focus a lot on the performance part of it. Um, so I try to manage my time, my environment, seek help when needed. And I try to teach my students to do the same as well. For instance, I find that many students might come from a different cultural background and self-seeking is something they don't really feel that they should be doing. Um, so they don't always reach out even when they have a problem, right? Right. Right. So there are things we can reflect ourselves, but also we can teach our students as well. Um, I think uh, there's a question in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Yeah. Who's, right? Smith is yeah. asking, how about the emotional domain in this respect? Right, that's a very good question, Mohammed. We talked about the metacognition and the self-reflection, right? Um, self-reflection um, is is when you reflect on your own performance and that's how you're going to judge your own performance. And that's where also you think about if you're happy or not, right? Emotion, emotions get on the way in here. If you are, um, let's say productive or proceeding, right? Uh, further, you know, um, proceeding with whatever task that you're doing, you feel happy. If you're not and you're stuck, the more you're stuck, the more detached from your task and the more and the less self-regulated you are uh, because you are demotivated. So what you called emotions, I will call motivation. And motivation is an extremely important concept in self-regulation 
both the uh, extrinsic, meaning the environment, as Lorita mentioned, right, um, around you, whether your uh, workspace that you feel comfortable, right, and without uh, any interruption, or the people around you as well that would support you or not, right, working from home or working, uh, studying online is extremely challenging to find the time and to find that quiet time, to find the, the space for you as the environment. So structuring your own environment is important. That's part of your external, right? What, what, or the extrinsic motivation. You say, okay, this is my space. I bought a new uh, desk, okay. I'm very comfortable here. I'm gonna have a flower next to me. I'm trying to make like, you know, my, my environment uh, appealing for, for me to be productive, right? And there is the in, in, intrinsic which is the, your own emotions, as I mentioned, whether you're happy about yourself or not. And also that interest incentives, right? That I, that I mentioned earlier, which is in the performance phase, yeah? Why am I doing this? Am I, am I doing this? I'm doing my doctoral degree because it has always been my, my, my dream, for instance, uh, as a, a personal example. Um, and for me, it's, it's, uh, it's gonna be rewarding so I, re I, I remind myself every day about that. So yes, emotions play a very important role. Yeah, there any? yeah mm -hmm. it says, um, Mohammed also mentioned, does it tackle social emotional intelligence? We kind of touched off that too. And he also mentioned self-reflection is the overarching guiding principle of self-regulation. I think it isn't just the third phase but a cognitive process that is there at every uh, very step. Yes, Mohammed, uh, it's um this model is is uh, includes three phases, and I would say the three phases are equally important. But um, we have different um, learning styles that also interfere, right? In in which um, balance that we do, or more weight that we put into uh, the continuum, if you think about. Uh, Lorita said her most important phase would be uh, tend to be uh, the performance phase. Um, I, for instance, unlike Lorita, I think the, the cognitive, the forethought phase is extremely important. As I wake up in the morning, as I'm getting ready even with, the, with my day, um, and uh, all that thinking in, in my head and planning in my head, and get into the mood, getting in the mood. It's extremely important, right? Um, so it's, it's really, there is no right or wrong, uh, but the three phases kind of, uh, it's a continuum um, depending on our own preferences. Yeah. Thank you. And we have another question. Yeah, thank you very much for answering that. That was quite detailed, yeah. <laughs> You're very welcome, Han. <laughs> Uh, we have a question. Gilson is wondering how should we avoid distraction in online teaching and learning? Distraction, yes. I mean, the literature talk about this. There are different types of distraction, right? The first distraction, again, is the space, the environment, right? Um, because your home, you need to find your own spot that you feel comfortable with that nobody would distract you. <laughs> Meaning for me, that's the only time is at night, unfortunately, right? Uh, during the day, it's, it's impossible. So I pick that quite, you know, few hours of the night. Uh, sometimes I'm sleep de deprived, right? But um, I have other colleagues who actually sleep very early and wake up early. So uh, it really depends on your uh, family and your personal, you know, uh, conditions around you uh, to find your own spot, the working space, and it has to be a working space, right? Um, I think before even getting the working space is again your mental state, right? You are at home. If you are uh, an instructor or a learner, when we go to the in-person classroom, well, we wake up in the morning, we have breakfast, we shower, right? We go, da -da -da, boom, 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 get ready. Okay, so you have, you can't really miss work and you can't really miss a class, uh, you take the transportation, et cetera. That is not there, which is good, but at the same time is a very uh, big obstacle mentally. Why? 
because you're too comfortable to be in bed, right? You don't want to move from bed and you're like, oh, okay, I can just get on my laptop in here, you know, and I'm listening. I'll, I'll listen to the recording. Do I have to really to participate? You know, that's the thing. So one of the tips that um, one of my colleagues with a, uh, you know, an extensive uh, online learning experience um, uh, gave me is to every day, never be in your PJs. Most of us tend to be, since we were home, we meant PJs, okay, I don't have to change, well, am I going out? No, going out, right? No, actually you have to get up, you have to shower, you have to put on your uh, clothes, like professional, whatever, or comfortable, at least not, not the PJ, right? Um, and you have to put a lipstick on if you're a lipstick on person, right? whatever perfume. So that gets into the mental state. Okay, I am going to work. Okay, your question is about distraction. Distraction, that's the mental distraction that, that I meant. I gave you the example of, you know, just you being too comfortable. Home, finding your own space, right? Online, we talk about hyperconnectivity. What does that mean? Hyperconnectivity is a concept that right now, um, you are connected, we're talking, but uh, we have the uh, ability just to go online. I'm going to check on Facebook, uh, you know, like somebody sent a message, oh, okay, I'm, I'm chatting with the other person, or I just remembered something that I'm doing, you know, even for serious or non-serious thing. Uh, okay, I can multitask, right? That's the idea of multitasking, but it actually is not multitasking, it's hyper-connectivity. You're all over the place, connected everywhere right? That is a big distraction for online learning. So setting goals is the key for not, you know, uh, falling into uh, hyperconnectivity. Um, one of the tips that we do for us as uh, online, um, you know, uh, learners and doctor students and online learners, for instance, we use some apps like there is Pomodoro, for instance, every 30 minutes, it's a 30 minutes fast, right? So you do, uh, what we do, we do not only daily um, plans or goal settings, but we do every half an hour. Every half an hour, I have to have a task done because I need to look at my lit review half an hour a day. I need to look at, you know, um, read another from whatever section, another half an hour. The other half an hour, I'm gonna move on to a different, et cetera, et cetera. So reminders, use the little tips and technology uh, to remind you. Uh, and avoid um, any distraction because you tend to go all over the place, set chunks. Yeah, did I answer that? I still have a lot of uh, more to say, <laughs> but I don't want to just, you know. <laughs> we have other questions as well, right? <laughs> right, that's why, yes. Oh, I see the chat is full of stuff. Yeah. Okay, so good to know. Do we have, you know, very little time to read Sure, absolutely. Okay, mm -hmm. so Mohammed is say, I guess setting into that professional mental state is one of the challenges of online learning and working. I think that's a good point. Yes, absolutely. Mahmoud also suggests how critical is self-regulations during normal times and abnormal times like this trial times of the pandemic? Another question. Um, I think help, I mean, self-regulations is always critical, whether in person or online, right? But we're talking about online here because, because the fact that I was just mentioning earlier, it's really hard. You're not with people, you're detached from your colleagues, you're from, uh, from everybody, everybody else, and you have a lot of distraction at home. You have the family, you have friends, you have food, <laughs> <laughs> fridge, <laughs> like that's, that's an excuse. I'm, I'm gonna have a break. I'm gonna have it, you know. But if you have so many distractions, you're mentally, you're, you're. It's really hard to contain that you are working, not home. Detach that home thing from from working, right? So it's always critical, um, and especially for online learning because it's autonomous, right? And that leads us actually to to the next question um, of our discussion. If, um, this is awesome. We have a great conversation going on and questions are coming. Mm -hmm. But we got to move on, right? <laughs> right. I'm sure we'll touch base on, on many of these Absolutely. questions. 
Thank you. That was awesome, everybody. So the other question is, what are some online learning environment attributes, Chadia? Can you tell us more, please? Yes. Um, so for online learning, the online learning environment require, requires three major concepts, right? The first one is the self-regulated learners, right? And what we mean by that, learners who are agents of their own learning, right? So we talked about autonomy, right? And learners who are able to use online resources independently as well, meaning uh, surfing the internet, going to databases, um, understanding the course design itself is a big challenge sometimes, right? And that's the, uh, the um, responsibility of the instructor We'll talk about it later as well. So, and that's that's the first thing. And not only self-regulated learners, but also self-regulated instructors. How is that? As an instructor, you need to tailor your design and instruction towards fostering self-regulation for your learners. How do we do that? There are different ways to do that. We'll talk about them as well, right? Um, the second point that the um, online environment requires is instructional self-regulation. How is that? Meaning learners become self-regulated, right? So we, we teach, basically, we, we provide the, 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 we lay the ground, right, to prepare our students to be self-regulated. And if we follow the three phases that we talked about in earlier, then we foster, as learners, we foster our own uh, self-regulation. Then we instruct ourselves. So we have, that becomes a model for us. Whatever really worked for one you know, task or two or three becomes you know, what kind of model to follow, right? In all the examples that we touched upon earlier. And actually the literature you know, um, says that uh, learners who become self-regulated are better performers in online learning. Online learning requires self-regulation, right? Because you're alone, you have to. You have to teach yourself. You have to um, motivate yourself. You have to uh, reflect on yourself, whether to punish or to reward yourself, right? You have to check on your performance. Um, and also you have to uh, find ways uh, when you're stuck, right? Um, so, and somebody touched early on the question asked about the de detachment and loneliness, et cetera. Yes, that is one of the things of online learning, but if you really look at it um, from a different angle, there are many other ways of fostering a community in online learning. And we are a great example. I don't know anybody of you, but we are together tonight, right? And we're learning from each other and we do feel kind of connected at least uh, through the topic, right? <laughs> yeah. So loneliness is uh, a fact, yes. But uh, as an instructor, your design would, for instance, um, require uh, some, uh, you know, uh, meetings together, groupings and meetings that is whether mandatory or optional. I'll give you an example. Saturday mornings for us and my colleagues, we have our coffee morning, 10.30 to 11.30. Why? Because we do want to feel connected together. Sometimes we'll talk about, you know, our proposals and our dissertations and our research and here and there and discuss a concept. Other times we just socialize, right? Um, so basically that little chat that happens before the start of the class or after the start, the, the end of the class and then in person, as an instructor, you find ways of kind of provide that to your uh, students or have them at least have them aware of, you know, these options not to feel isolated. And that leads us to the third one concept of learning environment, which is the social support. Because successful online learning is best designed on constructivist learning and socio-constructivist learning in particular for language learning, um, where learners co-construct knowledge together through collaboration and discussions and 
meetings and uh, working together. That social aspect of learning and particularly social support is crucial for self-regulation and for, for uh, online learning, right? And this could be from the instructor or from the peers or from any role model that you personally think that's a role model for you. Okay, do you have any questions? Okay, yes we do. So Mahmoud is asking, how do you expect learners to behave in response to your strategies of self-regulated activity? I am having a hard time to hear you, Gunul. Sure. How do you expect learners to behave in mm -hmm. response to your strategies of self-regulated activities? How to behave in response to self-regulated activities? You, you, you actually are not given activities for self-regulation. You are being the role model, right? So if, you're, if your design of the course is not friendly, right? and um, not clear. There is no, for instance, expectations. As a learner, if you say, if we go as language learners, um, they, if, if your design wouldn't go, week one, week one is something and week two is very different and week three is something new and week five is okay, back to week one, right? So all that confusion shows that you really confused yourself as an instructor Right, and, and you're not given you're not given the right model of uh, of being um, focused, right? So for, for you for your learners, you just you just be the role model and you talk about it. It's raising awareness because our language learners, in particular, they come from you know many cultures, many uh, parts of the world, and we do things differently, right? And expectations also are different. Um, academic expectations are different. And social practices are different. Cultural practices are different. So for you as an instructor, you need to talk about self-regulation to your students. And you need to uh, share your strategies. How do you self-regulate as an instructor? They are learners. Yes, they do different things from what you do, but you, the, the concept is the same. It's goal setting. How do you, you know, set your goal as an instructor? How do, you, how do you get into that mood as an instructor? How do you divide your time, time, man time management and all, all, all those things? So that's how um, you um, kind of pass it to your students in, in, in a different way, per se. You're not instructing, instructing as, a, as a concept itself, right? says also online coupled with self-regulation becomes more demanding when placed with the context of immigrant learners. I think that's a great point. Yes. And because mm -hmm. um, yes, I, as I mentioned earlier, the, the cultural diversity, especially here in Canada and our programs is um, uh, is very important and is something to consider. We cannot assume that we all uh, do things the same way. Um, and these things we learn, right? And self-regulation, as I said, is not a mental ability, but it's a process that you learn, you go through and you learn. Somebody at some point needs to teach you. I mentioned a role model many times. And um, I do have many different role models, right? Um, I have colleagues. I have uh, friends, I have family members, right? Um, and in particular, if for instructors, for instance, uh, or for learners, when, when you observe something that really worked, right? And say, oh, for, oh my God, Kunul is very organized, right? She has her own notes, she does this and that. Um, in her moderation as well, she is going over all the questions, etc. So. There is observation that happens of how others do things, right? So, and you take that, those behaviors from those people and you reflect on them and then you try them yourself, but that's not enough. As, an, as a learner, they don't know, right? Um, so many, especially online learning, they don't know that you really have to sit and um, that, that the, the fact that you need to sit around your desk is extremely 
difficult, <laughs> right? So by talking about it and by giving tips, right, as uh, try to find the best way, uh, try to find the best time for you, think about things that makes you um, focused, what is your learning style, et cetera. So that's how, that, that's how it works, pretty much. Actually, Stephen mentions in here a great point. It takes great self-discipline to overcome isolation in any self-learning process. It takes time and focus. I think those are excellent points. That's so true. Yes, that that's related to um, our 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 next discussion question, which is the third one. If you want to move on, that's very related. Um, uh, or we can wait as, as, as you like. There is a uh, question from Rhonda, if we have time, and then we'll mm -hmm, move on. Mm -hmm. What extra features would need to be included in the design of online lessons to better promote self-regulation? It's all coming up. These questions are all, all coming up. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, so that's yes. what we will be talking just talking now. Yes. Uh, what makes you a successful online learner or what makes your student a successful online learner as well? Yes. Us so, included, right? Uh, exactly. It's, right. It's, we're really no different. Mm. Um, the, the only difference for us is the design of our, you know, the, the, of our courses and the strategies that we can uh, pass on to our students. But we ourselves we have to experience that right, to be able to talk about it and to be also acting as a role model. So the very first thing um, that uh, a successful online learner requires is uh, needs to be motivation, motivation, right? You're, I mean, it's for all type of learning, but especially for online learning. Again, for all the other reasons that we talked about, you need to be motivated because you're the one who's gonna tell yourself, go and sit and study and set your goal and make sure that your goal is met, <laughs> right? And yeah, um, et cetera. And then that motivation will prepare you to be self-disciplined. So I think Mark or someone mentioned um, earlier self-discipline. Uh, yes, as a, as a successful online learner, if you're self-disciplined, then you are successful most of the time, right? Online learner. And you need to be a good planner, right? And a good goal Better, right? So for that to set your goals, there are a few um, tools like, you know, the smart tools, for instance, right? Or the, what we call the TOTE or TOTE, right? The T-O-T-E, right? Um, which is actually, uh, the, it's inspired by behaviorism. It's the test, operate, test, exit, right? It's kind of a building on the stimulus response of Skinner and behaviorism, but um, so uh, it's from there. Um, what is it when when you set a goal, then you test yourself if you really met that goal or not, right? If the goal is not met, then you take operations to basically meet those goals. Then you test again, and then the, if they are met, then you exit. You're done with that goal. So this is one of the strategies um, for. That, and the, the tools that we can use actually for um, planning and goal setting. And also we need to be comfortable with instructors or learners and confident and somewhat experienced in using technology because everything is happening online, right? Um, so in, in, in the literature, we talk about self-discipline and motivation as being predictive of online course successes, and that the desire and motivation, you know, to govern one's own learning processes uh, to become successful self regulated learners, right? It's all about self-discipline and motivation. It's backed up from literature um, and also, also experiences. So if online learners can become stronger here in, in the areas of planning, right? And uh, goal setting and self-monitoring, then they may improve their uh, ability to self-regulate because it's a process that we go through. And these are the things that we need for us to reach that, to foster that ability to self-regulate, right? 
which um, may in turn, right, if you're self-regulated and online learner, then in turn, it will raise your probability to become uh, academically successful, right? Um, again, we cannot emphasize enough the aspect of planning that includes time management and that includes allocating time for whether course activities or meeting uh, deadlines, right? Um, yeah. Is there anything um, from the chat that we... Yes, we have several comments from the chat. Mm -hmm. um, I hope we gave an answer to previous questions on how to prepare online learners to self-regulate. Um, Okay, so uh, Stephen is saying it takes great self-discipline and we mentioned that, right? To overcome isolation mm. in any self-learning process. It takes time, it, it takes focus and we just mentioned that great ideas indeed. Um, we have a comment here from um, Mahmoud that is saying we need to teach our students how to self-regulate, right? And adapt to the online learning environment which happened uh, in th these unprecedented circumstances. So we need to teach yes. them. How do we do that? Mm -hmm. by, by teaching, we need to provide um, uh, strategies, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, and strategies on how, how to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so if we if we go back to the idea of you know one of the strategies that we were talking about or the tools is the the test operate test exit tool for instance if you this is a great example to you know to share with students why because the challenge with online as I mentioned is hyper connectivity then to start to 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 start your task. And then you go and you Google a word, for instance, and then you have a list of words. You get distracted, you read the other little words and you're away from your main word, right? <laughs> so, mm -hmm. okay, so here, what I wanted to say, um, this tool is actually as a response to, you know, the, the, the concept of what we say, what we call the magical number seven, plus or minus, right? What does that mean? This magical number seven plus or minus is, puts limits, the, the limits and the capacity for processing on information. It goes back to the 1950s of Miller mm -hmm. uh, that proposed a law of human cognition and information processing. And Miller is saying that humans can effectively process no more than seven units or chunks of information plus or minus two pieces of information at any given time. Right. Right. So here as instructors, this is very, you know, related because you, you can't design a lesson and expect your students to be doing more than seven units, uh, plus or minus, meaning five or nine, five chunks or nine chunks maximum of information because they cannot process more than that. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, you know, very interesting. Yeah. So and here it's what learners can, can learn as a strategy and what you can share with, with your learners is to reorganize information, right? When you reorganize information into fewer units with more bits of information per unit, right? So as opposed to many, many, a lot of many units, right? Like um, that will be cognitively heavy to, to process. You give fewer units and then the, the learners, they take each unit and then you, they chunk them into uh, smaller pieces and bits of information. Um, this is very important because in the in-person classroom, you're there, right? Uh, you're the immediacy and, and, and the presence of the instructor allows you to, to answer questions or to uh, clarify like on the go, um, but so online, it, you're, you're not there, but you can, they can email you, yeah, they can call you, yeah, but you're not immediately there. Uh, be, yes, synchronously, yes, but um, we know online learning is not only synchronous, right? It's, uh, it's also asynchronous. So uh, whether in the blended format of uh, um, flipped classroom or uh, any other blended format or the online itself, um, it has a, an, a component where students are going to be working alone. So 
this is one of the strategies for self-regulation um, mm -hmm. and the concept of human uh, thought processes. Uh, thank you. We also have uh, an interesting comment from Susan. Uh, she's saying that sometimes it's more than a simple issue of modeling. People have a range of abilities and there's also neurodiversity as well as other forms of diversity in our classroom. Um, well, I said uh, that's important. Yes, that's very true. I agree. We have different learning styles. We have different um, cognitive. Uh, I don't use cognitive abilities because when you say cognitive abilities, that means one of us is smarter than the other one, which is not the case. Um, this uh, theory of self-regulation, that's how exactly I started. It's not that someone is able, mentally able to do and somebody else is not, or even in terms of performance, you're better performing than me. No, it's this process that we go through uh, with the cognition, with the, our learning uh, differences, styles, with uh, uh, all, all the things that you mentioned right now, yes, but it's a process that we go through to foster self-regulation. That includes all the things that we just talked about so far for 49 minutes, right? All right. So, um, yeah, I mean, um, if it, we it, know the strategies mm -hmm. and if we have uh, models to follow and if we um, are directed also, if we seek help, don't forget the social support because it's not, you're not alone, right? Uh, especially uh, online, you need to ask for support because you are actually alone, but there are other people to help you. <laughs> if you don't ask them, they will not help you, right? So that's why the social support is important. Then you, we are all able to foster self-regulation. Okay, uh, we have a last question before we move on to our other questions for tonight. Uh, mm -hmm. Mahmoud is saying, do you think that self-regulation varies among young and adult learners, especially for online learning? Well, online learning started 20 years ago. Distance education, right? It's been two decades for distance education. And when it started, it started for adults. Adults who have uh, different uh, commitments, personal commitments, whatever, professional, whatever it is, right? Um, to provide education uh, from the comfort of their home at uh, their own uh, space and pace for learning. So it is, it has started for adult learners, but the pandemic forced everybody to go online. And we even have my four year old daughter online every day. Mm -hmm. But if I, but if I watched, I mean, if I observe my online my learner as a four year uh, old learner, at the beginning it's, she's lost, right? And she wants to play because it's a computer. <laughs> so it's like so, and she wants to go to her show. There's, uh, <laughs> and there's so that's the distraction. It's, it's the same, so we're human beings. Maybe different levels and different degrees, yes. Um, but because of, she sees me, I'm her whole role model. She said, mama, you're studying tonight? Yes, I'm studying tonight, yes. What is, so it's, for her, okay, people study, they use a the computer, her dad is at home, he uses a computer. So she's kind of built up that habit of sitting because the very first thing with kids is to have them sit and focus, right? Of course, the spin of attention differs. Yes, we cannot expect young learners to uh, be there for a long time, right? It's the same thing as in the in-person classroom and it's the same uh, online. So. Yes, there are differences of age, but um, I, I, I'm going to say that we can self-regulate even the four-year-old is that at home. <laughs> right. It starts young. Right. Aronda has another question that we will um, cover. What is an example of um, 
of the seven plus fewer units with more bits, but we have discussion questions coming and um, Rhonda's question is, I think part of our question as well. So what are the implications of self-regulation on the online instructor? And maybe here we could go back to the seven plus or minus the magical number you mentioned earlier. Thank you. Hi. Okay. You're welcome. Yes, so um, as an online instructor, in a nutshell, what you need to do is you need to believe yourself in the importance of self-efficacy for your students and for yourself, right? You have to believe in it. Then hence, you need to be a role model showing that self-efficacy. How is that? Through providing a quality learning experience to your students. Again, I mentioned earlier the, you know, the confusing curriculum or the confusing package of your course that you put online, right? Um, then that is not a role model, right? Um, then also you need to make some instructional design and pedagogical considerations, right? Uh, how is that pedagogical considerations? You need to diversify the types of activities that you do, the types of assessment that you do, right? And also you need to provide a clear instruction of how, what, and was it, what is expected from your learners um, to do. Why? Because when a student logs in online and you're not there and they're trying to navigate your course and they don't really understand well what the expectations are, they are, from the very first uh, minute, you block them. So they overcome that motivation that we talked about and that step of, you know, sit around, then they're confused. And again, here comes the emotion that's, I don't know who our colleague that's mentioned about, uh, earlier. You block them, right? So, and we need to remember that online, what we say uh, orally in the classroom as instruction needs pretty much to be more detailed online. So we, instead of assuming that, okay, you, you do this and you do that, et cetera, no. Uh, what I'm trying to say here, the instruction in online, uh, in an online platform is more detailed and should be more detailed and in a clear way as if you were there. Even the basics of the basics that you think, oh, they will get, but they, they wouldn't because you're not there to answer immediately. Uh, if they're working uh, independently. So, um, so those are some of the um, design uh, points. Pedagogical designs is um, the metacognition, right? You need to give some, some of the activities that have them think about their own way of learning and think about their own strategies of, of, of learning. Um, I remember in my previous institution in Qatar, we had a whole division, right, in the department um, for learning strategies to teach our students how to learn because they're lost. And this is in person. That is even magnified, right, uh, on, in online learning. So you would say how they would know how to um, find external resources. But if the student comes from, you know, um, a low resourced country or background, then that's a new thing for them, right? So um, that is one, one of the, the, the things that you need to consider, like the learning strategies themselves and tips of how to find things online and how to um, manage your time online, etc. Yeah, and uh, also instructional strategies to foster an environment for self-regulated learning. So, um, and these uh, strategies, um, again, is um, needs and requires knowing your own students and the background of your students and engaging in an open discussion with your students about what is um, helping them or what is mainly most importantly impeding them if you notice one of your students is not performing well in online, there's got to be something wrong, right? 
then we need to meet with them um, as we do in, a, in an office, right? <laughs> a separate meeting. And at the same time, we need to talk about it as a whole class and engage in a discussion would share all the strategies, right? For instance, I find this time um, better to study or I found this is the way you search for, you know, easier or our task, you know, required X, Y, Z. And um, this is how I tackled the task. Instead of uh, starting with B, I started with F. That's actually a faster way, right? So engage in your students in a discussion and sharing all together their own ways because we're human beings and we're creative and we have different learning styles. Some we learn from each other. So that's kind of instructional strategies that you engage your students in talking about all the tips and strategies that they find effective. Okay. Okay, and now the floor to our members. <laughs> Let's see, I don't have, I don't really see any question, but we have nice comments in here. Um, Mahmoud says, this self-regulation process is dynamic and it can be taught to our students and not only through modeling. What do you think? Um, that's exactly what we have been saying. That's I totally agree with you, Mohammed. Uh, modeling is one of the things, right? A role model is one of the plan. Role model is one of the things. Um, but again, given um, to, uh, talking about it, given um, uh, sharing strategies, sharing your own experiences, because this is about experiences, right? This is about how we perform, how we motivate ourselves how we plan, basically, um, how we keep up with the plan, right? And we don't go halfway through and then um, we, don't, we don't do it. And everyone has his own way of doing things, yeah? But uh, if you're not aware of it, if you don't even think about what is really the problem, why you can't really do anything, right? We as um, students, uh, doctor students in online and, and distance education in our program, there is a pre-training that asks all these questions related to self-regulation even. Now, I never thought about it, but yes, now that it occurred to me, that all the questions are related to self-regulation to see if you're going to be able to be a successful online learner or not and for you to rethink about applying or not. Right, yes. Uh, Rhonda states, great point, harnessing students' ability to learn from each other through sharing strategies that work for them really diversifies the strategies available to learners. The instructor won't think of everything. Yeah, so basically you're guiding your learner's self-beliefs in the first place. You can do this. It's not about, like we said earlier, right? It's about organizing. It's about time management. It's about motivation, right? It's about um, uh, goal setting. Uh, it's about using, using effective uh, strategies that go uh, for you uh, as you're, with your learning styles, with your own environment, uh, with your own resources as well. So, um, it's all about that. So you need to plant those seeds of, of, of success and motivation into your um, learners, right? And, and their self-belief. And how many times did we just pick up the phone and say, I can't do this stuff? No, nope. you know, ah, and, and we cry. You know, that's what we do when you look at that. Saturday sessions, every now and then one of our colleagues cries because it's just too much, right? And, and and again, you're in your this space, but at home. Behind this screen, I have a million other things to do and to distract me, right? So I have to be con contain myself in this cocoon of, of me in my workspace, yeah? And then you have that self-belief questioning every now and then. So as instructors, we need to guide that and, and, and build that seed of hope and motivation and also guide them through goal setting we might, you know, ignore that, but and the expectations, right? Um, and that um, 
And now I'm talking about the instructional self-regulated strategies since we are, you know, in this uh, particular moment uh, with this comment, right? What we can do more is to promote reflective dialogue. Again, reflect on our own strategies, on, on their strategies we share, right? And provide corrective feedback. It's, it's extremely important um, uh, for uh, a self-regulated, um, as a self-regulated strategy. Why is corrective feedback important? Because because you need to know if you're on the right track or not, <laughs> right? Yeah. I'm writing and, and then I have no idea. I mean, is that right or not, right? Uh, it's the feedback that matters for me as an online learner is whether to tell me if I'm on the right track or not. And that relates to my, then influence my motivation, influence my goal setting, influence my uh, progress and so on and so forth. Once I don't have feedback, I'm stuck. And then once I'm stuck, I'm detached. And once I'm detached, I am not self-regulated anymore. And then we have to start again, that cycle and the process. It does, it's not like a one thing that happens. It's a constant thing. It's almost every day for me, every day, you know, it's like you wake up like, ah, oh, today I can have a break. I'm like, no, 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 no break today. You have to keep going. And you have the, you know, the, your, your board and you start or all the three phases that we talked about. And one of the other things that we can help learners with is to make connections of what they're learning, right? That's also related to self-regulation and their performance phase. Because if, if they cannot make connections uh, of what they're learning uh, when they're online, whether synchronously or asynchronously, then also that affects the, the, their self-regulation because it affects their motivation and self-esteem, uh, you know. Um, and another thing is to link new experiences also to, to prior uh, learning also, um, and this is the literature uh, as also identified in the literature as instructional self-regulated strategies. Okay. Awesome. Um, just quickly mention Mahmoud um, states, feedback and self-assessment are the heart of keeping self-regulation to move on. And Absolutely. he also suggests, I think it is important instilling learning, learner's autonomy Mm -hmm. Let them take ownership of their learning, basically. Again, goes back to autonomy again. Yep. And online learning. <laughs> <That's the way. laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great comments. Great discussion. Um, we will start with um, our breakout room activities. So, as usual. Um, sorry, uh, yeah. Lorita. Mm -hmm. So, I think we have one more. Thing, I think um, um, the only worry is that we don't have much time, but if you could. Yeah, I can just very that. quick. Yes, because those are the, the strategies, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think everybody's uh, looking for it, right? So here, the, some of the uh, implications for uh, self-regulation and the online learner. So there are four coming self-regulated strategies to help foster uh, self-regulation online. The, self, the, the first one is self-strategies. Again, right? So um, these self strategies relate to organizing and transforming information. For example, like when, when the, as an online learner, you come up with tables or you do mapping or how do you really organize and transform the information that you have on your own without the help of you know, anybody. Uh, goal setting and planning, the sequencing, the time management, the pacing of your learning as well, and keeping records and monitoring. For instance, uh, having your portfolios or journals or anything, or also rehearsing or note-taking or memorizing. Those are self-strategies. And they have also behavioral strategies. They're re related to self-evaluating, which is checking the quality of your work and your progress as well, and your self-assessment. You diagnose your own work uh, weakness and your own strength as well. And then from there, from there, you go for the consequences, whether you reward yourself or you delay the reward, right? And there are also what we call environmental strategies. Here, it's the environment and the online env environment that's uh, seeking for information. For instance, 
uh, you know, navigating the internet and um, becoming uh, very efficient in finding resources. Uh, environmental structuring, right? Um, the way you set up your, your office, your desktop, and have double screens and whatever that, um, that you need, all the things that happen online, uh, I mean, at home that can distract you, part of the environment. Also seeking social assistance as we talked earlier about. And the last one is motivational strategies. And uh, here we talk about self-determination, we talk about autonomy, we talk about um, uh, competence, uh, relatedness, also, uh, uh, also, and I will finish by emphasizing of to foster self-regulation, we have five selves uh, to emphasize, which is self-efficacy, right? And then self-motivation and self-determination and self-directness, self-assessment. So those are the five selves under the umbrella of self-motivation, efficacy, motivation, determination, direction and assessment. That's it. Wow, that was a quick but thorough overview. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you so much, Adia. Uh, right. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other comments, Kano, before we start? Um, let me see. No. The no. last okay. one I read earlier, so we don't have anything else, but that was a great, you know, cap up for the whole thing that we talked about. <laughs> Absolutely. <sighs> And um, so now it's time for you to uh, join the breakout rooms. As usual, we have a breakout room activity at the end of our TESOL dialogue session for you to uh, have a conversation with one another. And the question we have prepared is, how do you provide support to non-self-regulated learners? What could be three strategies based on everything we heard so far? What could be three strategies that you think would support non-self-regulated learners. So this is a question. Gonol will put you into breakout rooms and feel free to join and enjoy your conversation with one another. Awesome. Okay, welcome back. Hi, Kathy. Is it getting dark in here? Yeah, I'm gonna turn yes. on my light. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thought you were using a filter. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> It got dark all of a sudden, yeah. right? <laughs> Hi, welcome back, everyone. Yes, welcome back. 11 seconds. So I guess some hot conversation going on. So there's still waiting <laughs> the last minute. We find there is never time, enough time for our breakout rooms. Yeah. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> welcome back. Okay. So, Gano. Okay, everybody's here. So we will kindly ask you, room one, if you would like to share a minute or so, um, the discussion that you had with your colleagues. So in room one, we had Mohammed, Robert, and Susan, who would like to go. Well, I can quickly uh, start. I mean, I can say a few things and then others can join in. <clears throat> Absolutely. Uh, so we were talking about accessibility and approachability uh, in the sense that uh, in addition to having a generic framework, instructors should be more approachable and accessible. And so an interesting point came up, which was like, when we talk about accessibility, is it accessibility within the classroom and during the contact hours or can it go beyond that as well, depending on what the issue is? So like we had a, a very interesting discussion on that because like uh, there was an instance where there was some restriction in terms of um, going outside the classroom. But then of course, um, what, I, what I shared was that it also depends on the kind of work environment that you're in. Because like sometimes you do work in an environment which is quite extensive in the sense that they do have a lot of resources available. <clears throat> So like if the instructor is not accessible beyond the classroom, then definitely there are other people available uh, who can then facilitate, you know, mm -hmm. non-regulated, um, non-self-regulated students into- Learners. Mm -hmm. if, 
If I can just also pipe in, we also mentioned setting up, uh, like having a buddy system organized, like, like that the students themselves could connect, um, you know, and whether they set up like a WhatsApp group or, or WeChat or whatever the platform is. Um, and Robert also mentioned, uh, you know, um, clarity, providing clarity about these five elements and uh, checking in, just a lot of checking in on how they're doing in all of these aspects and maybe even having some signage around the room. Thank you. This was awesome. I love the breakout rooms. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, you know, room one for your feedback, mm -hmm. that was awesome. Let's move on to room two. So in room two, we had Daniela, Mahmoud, Mary, and Sarah. Anyone would like to pop in and share their ideas, whatever they may discuss in that group will be wonderful. Maybe a minute or two will not be enough for us for room two. Anyway, we hit on the background of the self-regulations when uh, things are just like meant for newcomers, especially then the new refugees who come from war-torn countries. And we ha they have their, their, their own problems, they have on sufferings. Anyway, there was a big question. Who decided what are those self-regulatory you know, traits that must be available and they must be mandatory on our learners? Who decided that? Actually, let's put it in a nutshell. Let's first build up their self-esteem as our presenter, she said. Let's have them believe in themselves, tell them they can do it, whatever you want to teach them of self-regulatory strategies, it could be through modeling, and you lead by example, you start with yourself, with your own stories, and you have to be very resilient, very patient, and know them before you start anything, just do your own assessment, check their own schemata, their knowledge, their culture. You have to be very, very sensitive when you choose what to teach them. So self-regulation, it could be a kind of changing a complete fundamental behavior in these newcomers, which, might not, which may, they might not take it willingly and just let them know that things do not happen over time it takes time and give them the, the time that they need and take them by their hand. If they want, if somebody shows up in the early morning, in the morning class, even when, before we went online, if they, if they used to come late, so you don't, you don't gonna embarrass them as, as it could happen in some classes, even if they come after half an hour or, or 15 minutes, you have to understand there are certain circumstances that stop them from showing up. So teaching them time management, showing up on time, this and that and others of self-regulatory strategies, always know what is behind that kind of behavior that you can deal with it and set the strategies and learn them to overcome all of their own drawbacks. This is what I can say. Believe in them, um, build their self-esteem, trust in them. Awesome, thank you very much, Mohammed. That's great points that you made. Um, do yes. we have time to move on, Loretta? How are we doing? Um, yes, from the other groups. Um, okay. It's 8.31, but we could continue um, okay. If more minutes. If everybody's okay with that, I think mm -hmm. we are you know, getting great feedback from other groups. I think good idea to listen to them. So let's move on to room three. We have Grace, Ida, Rhonda, and Timothy. Whoever would like to take the stage go for it. Hey Grace, um, I will um, start talking about our group. So we were just talking about the, the unexpected in a classroom, uh, for example, the current topics on vaccination and you know how students are feeling because right now they're getting the second doses and some of them are getting uh, kind of um, you know sick with the symptoms of you know having headaches and uh, extreme uh, fatigue. So uh, you know um, so sometimes we are detour in our teaching and and it's important to address those issues that are important to them at the moment. 
And also we were talking about this uh, disparity when it comes to learning online. We cannot forget that our learners, some of them, they have the desk computers, some of them, they have laptops, but we have students that are desperately trying. They are so motivated to learn English because it's useful for them in, in Toronto, in, in, in Canada. However, they are just having an iPhone or, or other phone and how difficult for them is to follow, you know, to do the exercises, to look at the text and, 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 and we cannot just undermine the effort they are putting. And, 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 and we are, you know, being, going online, we are just the lifeline for them in this all crazy, difficult, un, unprecedented circumstances. So uh, we need them, they need us. And, and we, we live in such a, you know, uh, times that we never expected we will leave. So we were just saying that last year, March 2020, we were wishing everybody ha have a, a nice March break. And here we are, it's June 2021, and we are still in this, uh, you know, circumstances that we are in. Oh, thank, thank you. Jane. Thank you, Grace. You touched upon a very important point, which is this, the support that we need to provide um, to our learners. Uh, and it's uh, uh, both ways. It's a social support, right? And it goes both ways, them and us together. So thank awesome. you. Thank you very much again. Uh, so let's go to room four. We have Andreas, Muniza, and Pamela. Anybody would like to share? Uh, well, yes, although I, I missed um, some of the things that we were talking about, unfortunately, because of the sound uh, issue. I still don't know what happened. Uh, I'm going to say something, and then someone else uh, from the group can, uh, can also... Uh, help me uh, on this. Uh, yeah, just, sure, definitely. Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, in uh, as uh, regards to the question, right, on um, how do we provide support to non-regulated learners, I, I, I just went to give my two cents, which is that uh, in my experience, uh, now teaching um, online for about a year during the, during the pandemic, I think that uh, something, a phenomenon that I saw that was very interesting was that, uh, what I call peer mentoring. I don't know if that's a term or not, but uh, it is it's something that I saw uh, as I try to model uh, the online um, behavior and, and uh, had rules and uh, I try to enforce them. I, I believe that was not as effective as the students actually um, connecting with me on a personal basis uh, through uh, um, a form of synchronous learning. Although the classes did not, some of the classes were mostly asynchronous, they, uh, with the times where we connected synchronously and we, uh, we connected with each other and they connected with, uh, with uh, other um, participants in the course, uh, it, it, was, it was really magic. Actually, that's the word. They would they would talk to each other. They would connect with each other. They would model, uh, role model each other. That, that some some of the students that had uh, uh, better study habits that they had, uh, they were more consistent in the attendance. They participated more. They modeled the behavior for other students. And since they happened to mostly, uh, in my opinion, like each other, so that was a, a, a good way them to reinforce these um, uh, behaviors that were so important for them to succeed in the course because in my case the course that I taught was uh, 14 weeks and and uh, in the middle of the on um, the, the pandemic it was uh, I had students that were uh, frontline workers uh, they had to go out and, and work outside some of them they could connect from the workplace and they did that uh, which it, to me was uh, really amazing. Um, they didn't miss many classes. Many of them went to all the classes and they connected with each other outside the regular uh, um, uh, classes. So, uh, and, and, to, and they, um, they talked to each other. They, uh, if they missed a, a class, they would, they would talk to the rest of the network. I call it a network because it was not a class. Only it's not only the experience in the class, but also how they connected with each other. 
So, Absolutely. So, yeah. so they connected with each other inside and outside of the class. And that to me was, uh, was uh, it gave me a, a great hint as to what I need to do in other courses uh, when I teach uh, online is to uh, not only to be a role model, not only to model and, and to also um, um, in many ways, uh, try to encourage the type of self-regulation, but to actually provide them with the opportunity to uh, self-regulate other people. In other words, to promote or encourage their self-regulation by, yeah, by yeah, um, behavior. Yeah. Peer, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, so that okay. was a great experience for me. And I, that's wow. how I'm going to be teaching the course in, in, in my, my future courses uh, in whatever is that's left in the pandemic or if I had to teach online right. uh, again. I'm glad this was the right place to be for you today, Andres. Thank you. Thank you so much. We could move on to room five. And uh, yeah. anybody? Meanwhile, and Andres, you, you mentioned the word reinforcement, which is a, a very important um, uh, concept in self-regulation. The cognitive process, the action, and the reinforcement, because we're trying to build a new behavior, right? Um, thank you. Yes. The reinforcement of the new behavior and to maintain that build thank on you. that yes yes mm -hmm. thank you chuck uh, i think we lost quite a few participants right. so, uh, we yeah. have only one person in here that i see okay. Brianna, for uh, room five if she would like to share otherwise we can move on no pressure mm -hmm. i've got them here gabriana if you want I, I oh. made notes. I was in the, uh, it was Gabriana and myself oh, and okay. uh, Colston. Yeah. So we're actually all yeah. still here. <laughs> That's good. Um, oh, great. Well, we looked at what, um, what might help um, non-regulated learners. And we did talk a lot about the, um, the emotional support, the motivation that other people have talked about. We also talked about helping them set um, manageable goals. Manageable was the, uh, was the word Colsom used, which I thought was great. And then um, uh, Gabriana said, what about helping them to identify their learning styles? Because if, they, if they're frustrated and they think that they're not getting ahead and they see, oh, actually I'm pretty good at doing this and it helps motivate them to move on and try other things. So those were our three strategies to, um, to help them with goal setting, to help them with motivation and to um, help them understand their learning styles. That's um, it. Uh, absolutely. It's, it's important to, uh, to remember the phases, the major concepts, the major strategies, but it's, it's all, we're human beings, right? It really all depends on our own learning styles and their own uh, environment also that uh, is uh, surrounding us uh, so that we can um, manipulate the environment and restructure, right, the environment accordingly. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, so, Loretta, would you like to... Um, oh, thank you um, so much to Chadia. I made sure um, we shared the contact details if you'd like to send her a question or a comment. Um, this is her email and LinkedIn account. So please do contact her if you feel like it. So thank you, Chadia, for this amazing session. Thank you.